Okay, I think I'm going to try and get started here, because if I get started on time, I can end on time. And I know many of you are here because you actually want to be here for the auction and have a good seat for the auction. <laughs> but hopefully I can give you a little entertainment in the meantime. Um, so the evolution of, govern of FreeBSD governance, uh, if you've ever wondered what happens when you get too old to code, then you get to talk about things like governance instead. <laughs> And uh, because I wanted to have this talk cover at least a, something a little beyond FreeBSD, um, I decided to start it out uh, by talking about this, uh, this booklet that uh, I received. It's uh, The Promise of Berkeley for Alumni, Parents, and Friends Who Shape Cal's Future, which is to say they contribute money to the university. Uh, at any rate, uh, this year is the 150th year of the University of California, which I realize for those of you from Europe is very young, but uh, by the standards of the United States, is, you know, it's getting up there. I mean, it's not Harvard or you know, one of those places. Uh, so anyway, uh, there's a, a section called uh, Game Changer Discoveries, and they list six discoveries that were, have been made at Berkeley that you know, had worldwide impact. So it includes things like in 1980 when they dis discovered that it was an asteroid that struck the Earth 65 million years ago that triggered the mass extinction of the dinosaurs. Uh, or in 2012 uh, when Jennifer Dodonna came up with the, the CRISPR, the thing for splicing and cutting up uh, DNA. And in 1942 when Glenn Seaborg discovered radioactive plutonium, one of 16 chemical elements including beryllium and californium that added to the periodic table. And 1998, uh, Sal Pirmuter with the acceleration expansion of the universe. Uh, in 1939 when Ernest Lawrence became Berkeley's first Nobelist uh, with things like the cyclotron. And number six, in 1977, Bob Fabry and his student Bill Joy created Berkeley Software Distribution, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so, <laughs> anyway, I'll pass a copy of it around in case you want to get all the details. Just pass it around. Um, okay, so. BSD is a big whoop, at least as far as the University of California is concerned. Never mind the fact that they run Linux from top to bottom and you, you know, <laughs> you try and find a student that knows anything about BSD and they look at you rather strangely. Is that like LSD? No, no, slightly different. <laughs> All right, so for those from OpenBSD and NetBSD, uh, that's all you're going to hear about your, your two operating systems for the rest of this lecture. Sorry about that. Okay, um, so let me just start off with a background and introduction. Where did all this come from? Uh, the Berkeley Software Distribution, BSD, started in 1977 as a project of Bill Joy at the University of California. And I got involved in 1977 because I was one of Bill Joy's office mates. And it was impossible to be around Bill Joy and not get sucked in. It's like, oh, could you just do this one little thing? You know, it you know, won't take but a few hours. And you know, two weeks later, blah, blah, blah. Uh, anyway, that originally was just a distribution of, of utilities, VI, and the Pascal compiler, C shell, and other things like that. Uh, but it became a full distribution with the release of 3BSD for the VAX in 1979. So that was the first release of BSD that included the operating system and the utilities around it. Uh, initially, that was a port of the 32V, which was the ver version 7 Unix ported to the VAX, uh, but with virtual memory added to it. Um, by, that's the, the main addition that was in BSD. Uh, it was just a swap-based system before that, 32V. Uh, it had the utilities that came with 32V, so all the, the usual CAT and LS and so on and so forth, plus all of the utilities that uh, Bill had been hacking on or pulling in. Uh, people like to think of Bill as, as a great software developer, but in fact he was even better at marketing. So he would go out and you know, talk up all this stuff and, and other people would say, oh, I've got this or that, and he'd bring it in and uh, pee on it to make it smell like Berkeley and add it to the distribution. At any rate, um, we moved to using source code control in 1980. A uh, very early source code control system called SCCS came out of 
the labs. And uh, initially, it just had the kernel on it, under it, but fairly quickly, uh, we got the rest of the, the system under there. So in fact, uh, you, the SCCS itself got converted over uh, to an SVN repository uh, by Peter Wem, I believe it was. And, or no, it was John Baldwin did that. Um, and uh, he has put it up. So if you actually want to go back and you know, find out who to blame for various and sundry things, uh, you can do that. Um, anyway, about a decade of releases were managed by the Computer Systems Research Group, uh, a four-person development team. Uh, that, of course, started out as Bill. Uh, and then Mike Carls, who's here today, and myself, and Keith Bostick, and Keith Sklauer, uh, then continued pushing that out the door with the help of various and sundry other people that uh, were peripherally involved with us there. Um, and finally, uh, at the end of the 1980s, actually, in 1991, uh, we did a release uh, which we called Networking Release 2, uh, which was more or less all of the system. The, it, we did a Net 1, which was just the, the TCP IP stack and the associated networking utilities. And we decided we wanted to expand that a bit. And we didn't really want to have to go through all the rigmarole of a release with the lawyers. So we said, well, this is just a revision of Net 1. Uh, never mind that it contains 10 times as much software. Uh, at any rate, uh, that landed a, a, a lawsuit against the university, uh, which finally got resolved in the university's favor in 1994 uh, when we did a release of 4.4 BSD Lite which was net two minus about six files to make the lawyers happy. And uh, of course, the addition of everything else that had happened in the meantime. So that 4.4 BSD Lite, well, net two was what started out being uh, the sort of the first release from open source release from Berkeley. Uh, and Bill Jolitz took that, added a few missing files to get it as a bootable system for the 386 architecture and was uh, releasing that. Uh, and then, uh, because he was sort of slow moving, uh, two groups, NetBSD group and the FreeBSD group, both formed uh, patch kits that came out of that. Uh, and so those two projects then evolved out of there. With the settling of the lawsuit, it, one of the requirements was that you had to switch over to using 4.4 BSD Lite as your base. Uh, the, I think that. Perhaps the, the people that pushed that requirement thought that that somehow was going to stop FreeBSD and NetBSD in their tracks, uh, but it did not have that effect, uh, thankfully. And so uh, away they went. OK, but that was the last release from the university. Uh, they switched, since SCCS was proprietary, they switched to the CVS uh, source code control system. Uh, which NetBSD continues to use to this day. Um, I'll talk more about that later in terms of FreeBSD. Uh, they also created a core team, uh, core team that had lifetime terms created to decide who should be allowed to commit. Uh, and uh, the initial distribution actually got done by Walnut Creek CD-ROM. Uh, Jordan Hubbard, who was one of that original core team, uh, ended up being uh, hired by Walnut Creek CD-ROM, along with Rodney Grimes, who's around here somewhere as well. And uh, Walnut Creek basically provided the place to do the builds and to get the distribution going and so on. Uh, so that was sort of the first home base, if you will, for FreeBSD. Uh, one of the problems was that stuff just kept getting accreted and accreted, and the distribution kept getting larger and larger. And so fairly early on, they realized, all right, we're going to switch to having a base system and then ports. Uh, and you know, if we sort of keep the base system as, as a manageable thing, uh, we can then let ports sort of grow uh, and not have to worry about the whole distribution getting too big. Uh, and then NATS also got brought up to manage the inevitable bug reports. Uh, they were just as well managed then as they are today. Well, it appears to say it needs work. Uh, FreeBSD continued to move forward and started being picked up by uh, commercial organizations. In particular, Yahoo was one of the very early, very big users of FreeBSD, which ran pretty much their entire organization on it. Uh, and uh, as the, the demands for 
what we needed for machines to, to maintain uh, all of the state of the, of the, process, of the project grew. Uh, it moved from the couple of machines at Walnut Creek CD-ROM to Yahoo. Uh, who had not only the machine resources and the 24-hour uh, management of the machine rooms and particularly network capacity, uh, which was needed to do the, the ever-growing distributions. And this, this was great, um, you know, having a company that's willing to basically run your infrastructure at no cost to the project. Well, of course, the project had no money, so, you know, there wasn't a lot of choice there. Uh, but Justin Gibbs uh, decides that you know, this is not a good long-term strategy because, you know, companies might change directions or, you know, fade from the scene, and then we would be up the creek. And so he started the FreeBSD Foundation with the concept that it could bring in enough money to provide for the FreeBSD infrastructure. Uh, well, that took about 10 years before it actually had enough income, reliable income, that it could start to do that. Uh, and luckily, Yahoo was perfectly happy to continue supporting the, the project over that period of time. Uh, so it was, it's only been in about the last five to seven years that uh, the FreeBSD Foundation has slowly taken over the, the infrastructure management, moved it out of Yahoo and a couple other places where it was scattered around, uh, and is now able to fully uh, handle that. All right, so meanwhile, how about the project itself? Well, as a, you'll see as a sort of recurring theme, one of the problems you have with open source projects is that people get all excited and they do a few things and then they kind of get less excited and other things start picking up in their life. Uh, and so you end up with deadwood. And if you get too, dead, too much deadwood, then the whole project sinks just by virtue of there being so much inertia and inability to get things done. And the core team had grown to about 20 people because once you were on, you know, you were on for life. And you didn't want to leave because then you'd lose the prestige of being on core. Uh, so this core had gotten up to 20 people uh, and only about, let's conservatively say maybe half of which were doing anything uh, and about a quarter of whom were really actively doing things. And so it became evident that we needed to do something about this. And so a group of uh, FreeBSD folks uh, got together and decided that they would create a set of bylaws and part of setting up the bylaws would be that uh, you we would have elected quorum. Uh, so we'd take the, you know, the rules that you know today, pretty much the, you have the, uh, anyone that's a committer of any sort is allowed to uh, run and uh, all the committers get to vote and the top nine vote getters become core for the next two years. Well, of course, in order to get the bylaws put in place, the existing core team had to vote for it. And if you're about to put bylaws in which say you need to be elected and there's only going to be nine of you, then that means that by definition half of you are not going to be on core. And uh, so they're, they're not incented to, to put these bylaws in place. Uh, and so instead what we had to do in order to make this work was to grandfather the existing core. Uh, and just hope they didn't actually read the, the bylaws, which most of them didn't and put them in place. And then, and only then, two years later, when they were asked if they wanted to run and said, oh, but I'm grandfathered, you said, uh, didn't you read them? You were grandfathered for the first term. There's a couple of them that still will not speak to me, but. <laughs> All right, so now we have core, and uh, they're elected, and, and this is, you know, it's not a great system, but it's the best system that seems to be generally available. Uh, and it's, uh, I mean, we, we went from, you know, grand omnipotent high stomper, the, the Linus Torvalds model, which was Bill Joy and Mike Carlson and myself. Uh, then we went to the uh, sort of semi-grand omnipotent high stamper, which was the, you know, core for life. Uh, and now we've moved into where we can routinely uh, change out the core team 
And you, you obviously don't want everyone to change all in one election uh, because you would you'd lose too much uh, institutional memory. But in fact, it, it seems to sort of move forward. You know, about half of it turns over uh, with each election, or slightly less than that, which seems to be good. We've had sort of I, I would sort of call it three leadership groups, if you count the original core, and then we've had at least two leadership groups in, in the elected core since. So we actually are doing a good job of, of moving forward and letting people that have gotten burned out move along. All right, so what do the core teams do? Uh, I assume most of you know this, but just for reference, we have, uh, they oversee the, the port manager team, who sees, oversees the, the ports committers. We have the documentation team, which oversees, I was impressed to say, 126 doc committers. Uh, if, if you, you know, look at almost any other project, if they even have doc committers, I bet that it's, they're lucky to break a two-digit number. Uh, we have the security officer, who handles security issues, alerts, and updates. The administration, system administration team that oversees the infrastructure. The release engineering team that oversees releases and the QA team, which we're just now really getting going, uh, that uh, deals with continuous integration builds and expands the regression tests and so on. And uh, you know, core nominally is responsible for all of these things, but they break it out and there's really teams that are doing these things. Uh, and so core mostly gets involved when things go off the rails. Okay, so the FreeBSD project today Initially, believe it or not, there was the FreeBSD mailing list. You can imagine how well that worked. Uh, it, of course, got broken up into a lot of area-specific lists, like architecture and networking and file systems and blah, 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 blah. Uh, but the problem is there got to be so many lists that if you really wanted to know what was going on, you had to watch too many lists. Uh, and so it became necessary to have some way of getting cross-area collaboration. Uh, and initially, it was done sort of through the bug tracking system. Uh, NATS later got upgraded to Bugzilla. Uh, the project moved to Fabricator in 2014, primarily so that we could expand the discussion to non-committers. It was very difficult for, for people that were doing development but not committers to, to really interact. And so Fabricator uh, made that possible. And, uh, you know, there's been a long list of complaints about Fabricator, but it's a step forward from where we were before. So uh, we'll leave it at that. Source code control. Well, the project started on CVS. And there's been, there was a huge amount of debate about moving to something else. And uh, NetBSD has been struggling with this of late as well. Um, and so. Eventually, in 2000, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, um, we did switch to Subversion. And now there's been ongoing debate about switching to Git with all of the same arguments that we had before. Uh, the arguments in favor, there's a lot of programmers that know and use Git. Uh, there's, for several years, there's been a, everything that gets checked in immediately gets pushed down to, from Subversion to GitHub. Uh, but the problem is upstreaming from GitHub uh, requires going through Fabricator. So you've got to you know, pull a change request up to Fabricator and then go through that and then get that pulled into the main system. And that, there's too much friction there. Uh, and so being able to just do pull requests directly uh, would be helpful. On the other hand, uh, you know, it wouldn't be on GitHub because the project just sort of in its DNA wants to control that repository. Uh, and so, you know, there's a, lot, there's a lot that would have to happen to be able to get to Git. Uh, we'll see where we go. Okay, so the, the workflow. Um, committers are up in up to three groups. Uh, we have documentation, which is all the FreeBSD documentation, ports, which are all the ports, and source, which is the base system. And the key thing is that changes that can affect a kernel interface or operational semantics and various sundry other things uh, get put up in Fabricator for review. And uh, all non-trivial changes require a review by somebody else. So I may want to change the fast file system. And I can't just say, well, I've done it for 30 years. You know, Just trust me on this one. I actually have to get someone else to look at it. 
And that turns out to be a good idea because, you know, sometimes even if you think you know what you're doing, you don't, in fact. And uh, having someone point this out to you before you've broken things is generally better than afterwards. So the, uh, and again, a lot of this depends on people working together. I mean, you, you, you have to, to essentially, you know, at least put feelers out and know some other people that can do reviews of things you're working on. You have to actively go out and review things uh, for other people. And so meetings like this are ideal because you actually get you know, everybody in a room and you actually meet a bunch of new people and you find out about things that they're doing. Uh, and that will then go on and help integrate making some of these other things that need to happen happen. OK, so FreeBSD has commit tags. Uh, and uh, you know, the commit tags include you know, a bunch of information. Uh, which other project member has reviewed the changes? Now, this is an important one because it forces you to put the name of somebody on which you can add at freebsd.org. And you know, if something really stupid goes in there, you can say to that other person, you know, how did you possibly pass that in review? And if they say, uh, uh, they just made that up, you're in deep yogurt. So uh, you, know, you really do have to get the reviews, and you really do have to listen to it, uh, because that other person, you know, if you've asked to, been asked to review, you can't just sort of say, oh, yeah, they know what they're doing, and say yes, because if, if it blows up, uh, you're going to be almost as much to blame as the person who put it in there in the first place. And this is especially true if you are mentoring somebody else because you're supposed to make sure that they don't goof up. And so if they goof up, that, that makes you look like a really bad mentor. Uh, many things do come in from bug reports. So if there's a related bug report, you, you tag that. Uh, and that will also uh, put a message back to whoever submitted the bug report and anyone that's following that bug report so that they know that things have happened. Uh, Things that get discussed on Fabricator, again, are noted so that the, the linkage goes back to Fabricator. Uh, and then if, if, the thing, if the report, if the bug is something that should be pushed down into the stable levels, uh, you note when that's supposed to happen. And one of the more interesting and more recent things that's gotten added is a sponsoring organization. Uh, so if you work for a company and, and you're, you know, let's say, pick a random example, Netflix, uh, and so there's something that you've done there, but you're, you're pushing up to the master tree. You can put that in so that your organization gets some credit for the fact that they're paying for someone who's actually doing useful stuff in FreeBSD. And my favorite one is at the end, if sometimes what you're doing is you're checking in because you did some particularly stupid thing earlier. Uh, and then you get, it's the pointy hat tag. Uh, and you, you put that in if, if it's basically a mea culpa uh, fix to an earlier uh, thing that you checked in, usually with the note of which one that was. All right, so now, here, now we start to get to the hard stuff. How do you work and play well together? All right, so the project started out with behavior guidelines based around commit behavior and rules for suspending commit privileges if you misbehave. So you know, don't get in commit wars. Don't, like, one person put in a change and then the other person go, no, that's not right, and put in their change. And then the first person switch it back to what they had before. Uh, and uh, this, this hasn't actually happened too horribly in recent years, but it, it used to be a not infrequent enough occurrence uh, that uh, there actually got to be some fairly detailed rules. Uh, inevitably, you know, Cora has to step in at some point and say, you know, knock a couple heads together, you know, get the two to agree on what it ought to be and put that in. Uh, and if, if they're too busy counter committing against each other, then Core can pull the plug and just say, okay, the two of you are, you know, in the corner for a week. Uh, neither of you can commit for a week until, you know, everything calms down. And then after a week, if that's not enough, then it can go to two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, et cetera. Uh, and sometimes it just gets to the point where you, a, a person has to leave the project. 
Uh, that's only happened a, two or three times in the 25 years that the project has been around. But sometimes there's just such fundamental differences of opinion that that's the only solution. And obviously you don't want to do that, but if that's all you can do, that's what happens. Okay, so having core kind of act as the, as the adult in the room worked very well for a long time uh, until Gamergate blew up. And when Gamergate blew up, that just, you know, it was no longer in the FreeBSD project, it was all over the web. And it became clear that what we had as rules, which had worked very well for a long time, were just not up to the task of the, that situation. So it was decided that we needed a more formal code of conduct, which was drawn up by a well-meaning but inexperienced set of folk. That is, people that uh, hadn't really done a code of conduct before. They just kind of looked around the web and pulled some things together and put it. Here it is. And the feedback was, this is insufficient. It just, it's it looks like it was written by amateurs that don't understand how to do this kind of thing, which it was. So, okay, fine, we're gonna do it right this time. So it was replaced by a code of conduct drawn up by folks with more experience. But the problem here was that it was overbearing. And uh, it, it was a code of conduct that might work well in certain situations, particularly corporate situations, but it really wasn't tailored to what FreeBSD needed or wants. So a third revision of the code of conduct, I am told, is in the works. Uh, Jeff Roberson has collected a bunch of information, uh, and I, it's pretty much geared up to wait for the next uh, core to come in rather than the existing core, which has been involved in the first two of these. Uh, so that you know, we can get some new eyeballs on it and hopefully get some more feedback from you know, all of the, everybody in this room and elsewhere in the project. Uh, there are people that would just like to go back to the old days and we already have proof that that doesn't work. So we need to do something here with a code of conduct and hopefully the third time will be the charm and we will have something that people are both happy with and will, will bring us into the modern world of what we need. Uh, so we'll see where that goes. FreeBSD committer turnover. I've already talked about how we had to get rid of dead wood in core. Well, that's not just core that's the issue. We have the same issue with committers as well. Uh, you know, people get excited, they work for a while, and then they sort of fall off the, you know, on, and move on to other things. And you have to have some way of eliminating them because otherwise you just end up with too much dead wood. And you have to have a good way of doing that in a way in which it's not perceived as the, the you know, people in charge picking on individuals. And so there, it, it has to be essentially an, an algorithmic way of deciding that you are dead wood and it's time for you to move along. Uh, and it has to, everyone has to understand what the algorithm is. And the algorithm is pretty easy. It's you drop commit privilege after one year of inactivity. Uh, and uh, so if you just don't do anything, and, and this is like a microscopic, all you gotta do is go once a year and change your personal information in your you know, committer description, and that does it. Okay, so I mean, you, it, it's not like a lot of effort to, to remain a committer. Uh, and I did notice a, a, a large number of those commits happening recently so that people would be eligible to vote for core. Good on you. Okay. Uh, and in fact, if you haven't made an entry in the calendar file yet, please do that. Uh, that'll count. <laughs> All right. Uh, so for up to about two years, and, and this is not quite as hard and fast because core kind of gets to decide. but. After the one year where it's dropped off, if you won't come back, you know, after 18, 20 months or so, core will generally say, okay, fine, you know, just turn it back on again. Uh, but uh, after it's been more than about two years, you actually have to go through the whole getting on board process again. And a lot of that is because the way the project does things just changes over time. You know, we 
changed from Bugzilla, from Nats to Bugzilla. We've added Fabricator. You know, there's just all kinds of things that have that have just being done in different ways. And so you can't just come back and just jump into it, uh, be, doing things the way they did were done five years ago because people will get upset, reasonably. So. What ends up happening is that you, you still get a mentor, just as you would if you were a brand new committer. Uh, but typically, you don't have to be you know, a mentee for a year. Uh, you can often, just in three to six months, be up to speed again. And you know, your mentor will say, OK, you got it, go. Uh, which means they're off the hook for you doing stupid things. All right, so the FreeBSD project has done a very good job of you know, getting rid of the deadwood. But of course, the other half of that is if you just get rid of people, then pretty soon you don't have anybody left. And so recruitment turns out to be just as important, if not more important, than getting rid of the deadwood. OK, so you've, you've got to bring in new developers. And there's quite a few places that this can be done. Uh, a lot is contact via university courses. Uh, there's this whole website that several of us have been working on called Teach BSD, uh, which is setting up curricula that can be taught in universities and going out and actively uh, doing stuff in universities. Uh, Robert Watson and George Neville Neal partic in particular uh, have been doing a lot of stuff at Cambridge. Uh, another key place to get them is people working in a company that's using FreeBSD. I mean, and I mean, if the company is using FreeBSD, they are almost certainly doing some level of development and almost certainly has things that need to be upstreamed. And so it's both to the company's advantage and to the project's advantage to get <laughs> those people brought on board as committers so that you know, instead of having to nag somebody uh, to get things put in, they can just do it themselves. Uh, and this is of late proven to be a very good channel for bringing uh, people in. Now you'd say, why would someone want to become a committer and just have extra work to do you know, after you've done your 50 hours of work at the company? Now you're going to do another 10 hours for FreeBSD. Uh, but it turns out that if you're a committer to FreeBSD, it actually raises your value. Uh, so if you change jobs, uh, and there, it, it tends to give you a salary bump when you go to another company that's using FreeBSD because you're already a committer, and this is viewed as a, a very useful asset to have. Uh, so in fact, uh, we've had very, uh, very good uptake on bringing in people that are working for companies uh, and become FreeBSD committers. Another key place that has brought in a lot of, of new committers over the years has been the uh, Google Summer of Code project. Uh, FreeBSD has typically been given 10 to 15 slots in Google Summer of Code. And uh, for those of you that have paid any attention to Google Summer of Code, uh, most projects are thrilled to get two or three spaces. And we are routinely getting 10 to 15. And we could have more if we could get more mentors and more projects in line. So, you know. There's a, lot of, there's a small set of people that work very hard on Google Summer of Code, and it would be great if we could get some more people involved in that. Uh, and then finally, there's just discovering the project at a conference or through social media. Um, and particularly EuroBSD, which moves around to different countries every year, uh, we get a, a large influx of people that have never heard of BSD. And all the projects, and not just FreeBSD, but NetBSD and OpenBSD, uh, tend to get a lot of excitement and, and new people that come on and start working with the project. It's key that your project be welcome, welcoming and easily entered. It, I mean, you come here and it's like, oh, yeah, it's, you know, I know everybody, blah, blah, blah. Well, if you're new to the project, you don't know anybody here, hardly, other than maybe their name. And so, especially those of you that are older timers, try and make a point of talking to the new people and welcoming them here and making it sound like it's a fun place to be and not a terrorizing place to be. Um, so provide an easy path to connect with the project and provide mentors to help get people up to speed. Again, mentoring is not for everybody. There's some people that come up and say, we want to be a mentor. And it's like, we have some other things that you could help us with. Um, but most of the people, here could be good mentors. 
Uh, and, you know, well, how do I become a mentor? Well, talk to us. There's, you know, anyone from CORE talk, say you want to be a mentor, you'll be their best friend for a day. They might even buy you a beer. So what is the net effect of all this? Well, I've been collecting statistics over the years. In fact, this is something I cranked this, this script actually an hour ago and updated my slide um, because uh, one of our new committers is 21. And the, previously, it was uh, 23, I guess, was the youngest committer that we had. So I was very happy to be able to you know, pull this slide out. Uh, it didn't knock the median or average down. But nevertheless, it uh, uh, helped push it that way. Uh, at the other end here, um, I, I'm unfortunately three from the top here. Diane Bruce has got me beat. She's here. And Greg Leahy, he who's not here, but uh, he's out here at the end. If you just take off the, the, the over 60 crowd here, the, the uh, median and average both drop down to around 38, 39. Uh, so you know, just, just get rid of the 10 old geezers, and, and your graph will look better. Um, at any rate, uh, the, the key thing to note here is, first of all, this big, huge spike, which is late 30s, early 40s. Uh, and the project has stayed right in that number range for more or less a decade. When it was very, when it first started up, it was down in the low 30s, and it has slowly risen. Uh, it, it slowly rose into the high 30s, and it's pretty much been there for at least the last eight to 10 years. So we are doing a good job of bringing people in, and that's good. Um, it, it, it's if a project is going to have a long lifetime. You've got, to, you've got to keep this de age demographic. You don't want it to age out. And in particular, if you look at the Linux project, Linus Torvalds and his lieutenants are pushing out on that curve. And they are not doing a good job of bringing in uh, younger people. They are bringing in a lot of people in companies. So it's not like that project is going to go away. But the, the, the sort of image of what Linux ought to be is going to become a corporate one uh, if they don't somehow work to replace that top set of people. Uh, at any rate, some of the other numbers are kind of interesting here. Uh, the calendar.previsd is where I get the ages. So there's 46 of you who won't uh, ante up what your age is. I actually sent out a, uh, an email in the middle of last year to everyone that I didn't have an age for and said, either put yourself in the calendar or tell me what it is, and I'll put it in my secret one that I won't tell anybody else uh, what it is. Uh, and it's about time to do that again, because I had it down to around 25 at one point. Uh, and someone was saying, oh, yeah, I saw a big flurry of changes to calendar.freebsd. What was that all about? Like, me, e email. Um, so anyway, if you're not in the calendar or you haven't already sent the information to me, um, I'd appreciate it, especially if you're younger. <laughs> Bring that age demographic down. <laughs> all right. So. The FreeBSD development model. Some of it works and some of it not so much. What we do great at is small changes, especially ones that are easy to identify, reach some consensus on, and implement. And when I say small changes, I mean changes that can be done by one or two or three you know, individuals working together. Uh, and, and we have numerous examples of things. And it, you know, it's, it's not like that small of a change. I mean, we got SCTP brought into the system, but you know, that was basically Randall and a couple of his cronies that did that. And they didn't need like, you know, everybody in the project to, to be involved in order to make that work. It's the larger, wide-ranging changes that are hard. Uh, so some examples. Switching from CVS to Subversion took nine years. And the problem was, that we would start with the discussion, and everyone would say, oh, well, there's this, and there's this, and there's this, and have you considered this, and have you considered that? And blah, 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 and, and, and there would be no uh, consolidation on, on one particular thing, and it would die out without resolution. And then 18 months to two years later, it would be like, oh, we need to do this. And we'd forget the entire discussion we'd previously had. And we'd have the same discussion all over again. And the you know, mailing list would be flooded with stuff. And blah, blah, blah. It would die out. And it was finally accomplished by Peter Wem, who just said, I'm sick and tired of this. I'm just going to do it. And he just did it. And one day it was click. And now we're under subversion. Uh, this is not an ideal way of, of handling this. OK. 
The other huge change came when we went from the single threaded to the symmetric multiprocessing, uh, which was between FreeBSD 4 and 5. And this required changes, obviously, throughout the entire system. And you, you sort of have this theory that, it, well, we'll just put a giant lock in, and then we will just slowly unlock things bit by bit. And you know, forget PID, that's pretty easy to do. But when it gets to things like the networking stack, where you've got locking, well, let's see, we've got packets going down, so we're going to lock from top to bottom. Oh, and we have packets coming up, so we're going to lock from bottom to top, and <laughs> deadlock. So it's not that easy. Uh, so we started, just to, be, you know, just to make it interesting, with a big debate as to whether, what kind of locking we were going to do. We're going to do the Solaris-style locking or the Amigo-style lockless stuff. And that debate raged for a while. And eventually, it got decided that we were going to use the Solaris style of locking. And the, the lockless people weren't willing to give up and kept trying to put that in. And that's when there was an eviction of a member of the team. Um, but you know, once we got that sorted out, then it still required this just massive coordination. And for any of you that remember, it was a long gap between 4 and 5 coming out. And 5 came out kind of because we had to. It had been so long. And 5 left a bit to be desired in terms of stability and so on. Uh, and it was really not until 6 came out that we really had sort of gotten over the hump. But uh, you know, that. Both of these are examples where the model of just sort of making changes and everyone sort of coordinating on mailing lists uh, just doesn't cut it. So how do we do better on those things? So we recently, as in about a year ago, uh, CORE created the FreeBSD community process, which is modeled on the Python enhancement process. And the idea is we want to get away from this, have a huge argument, and then do nothing and forget about it, and have the same huge argument again and do nothing about it, and so on. Uh, and just for an example of something that, that's on the horizon that we're going to have to deal with is deprecating I386. OK. We've already had you know, one round of discussion on this. Uh, it's clearly not time for it yet, but the time is going to come. And we really don't need to keep every you know, 18 months having a big discussion with the same arguments over and over again. So this is a classic case where this will hopefully help us do this in a much more rational way. So the major changes are described in the document. Well, the major change is pretty easy. We drop I386 support. Uh, but then there's, you know, here's the reasons why. Here's the reasons why not. Here's you know, reasons, the, the, the why not reasons may die down over time. Here's some of the ways that we can determine that they're dying down. Uh, and so th we have that whole you know, distillation, let's say, of the discussion that we've just recently had on the mailing list, and put that into one of these documents. And this gets reviewed by an editor whose job it is to, to you know, edit, make sure all the opinions are there, and, and you know, so on. And then it gets published for discussion. And as the discussion continues on, those comments get put in there. And when the core team feels that we've, the discussion has kind of died down, then they make a vote on deciding you know, whether we're going to move forward with that particular thing or not. Now, in the case of I386, they will almost certainly decide, no, we're not going to do it at this time. But this document is there. We've had all these discussions. So 18 months from now, <coughs> instead of starting from ground zero, we can restart this document, which we already have a bunch of things in, we say, all right, what's changed? All right, well, some of the reasons for keeping it now have gone away. So we'll move them from this pile to that pile. But then there's some other reasons that have add, come back in. And so again, we'll have you know, sort of the discussion will move forward. We will probably still decide two years from now that we're not ready to get rid of I386. But you know, eventually, we will come around, and the document will get to the point where the, the reasons to keep it will be dominated by the reasons to get rid of it, and it will happen. Uh, and it will happen with, let's say, one-tenth of the amount of mail on the mailing list as we would have if we just keep with the current scheme of arguing about it every 18 months. So uh, this hasn't really gotten a good test yet, 
but I think we've got some ideal candidates uh, that should go through this process. Okay, another issue that has arisen of late uh, is the core team interaction with the FreeBSD committers. Uh, in particular, there were some that felt there wasn't enough communication about the code of conduct, can you imagine? And so there's been a push to try and get core to be a little less opaque. Uh, historically, all the com core communications were private among core, and a monthly report would be thrown over the transom once a month saying, oh, and this is what we did. You know, these people got commit bits, and we had discussions about these topics, and we made these, these decisions. Period. That was it. Um, so there was a feeling that there wasn't a good way of, of giving feedback to core. All you got to do is say, well, oh, I don't like that decision. You know, it's like, well, tough, it's been made. You know, wait for next month. <laughs> so the, the, in recent time, core has started releasing an agenda of the discussion topics uh, so that you can see what they're going to be talking about. And if there's something that is of interest to you, you can provide some feedback before they've had the discussion. Now, this is a nice idea, but the problem is that they have, I mean, when you look at the thing, it, it's this laundry list of stuff of which they don't actually end up doing all of those things in that meeting. They just want to pick through a few of them. And so it would be nice to know, well, what are the things you're going to actually talk about in this upcoming meeting uh, as opposed to, yeah, well, someday you're going to talk about that, maybe. Uh, so that, you know, a little bit of work needs to be done there. Uh, there's also contemplating allowing committers to join the, the video conference, uh, not being able to talk, but being able to at least listen and, and perhaps poke in questions through IRC or something. Uh, now, there's certain things where they have to deal with personnel issues, and obviously that it's just going to have to be a closed session. But you know, just like when you have a board of directors, most of the meeting is open, and then there's a small uh, s section that you have where it's just the board. Um, but again, that's you know, a relatively tiny piece of, of what they have to deal with most of the time. So there is a hope, and, and this is sort of my throwing it out to the whoever the incoming core gets to be, um, that this is a nice start, but you know, keep pushing this forward. Okay, finally, this, the FreeBSD security team. Uh, security has been a lot in the news lately, and uh, uh, on average, the project has done well in this domain. Uh, but unfortunately, it is it's a job that's really hard for volunteers in particular, because it's mostly nothing to do until there's a fire drill in which they need 110% of your time. And you might you know, have like a, another job, uh, and your employer doesn't want to just give you a month off with you know, 30 seconds of notice. And uh, so uh, the people that have done it have, have, you know, have done an excellent job, but they get burned out. And uh, so we'd had a series of very good uh, security officers but we had gotten to a point where you know, we needed someone who could do it, uh, especially with you know, a lot of things that have been coming down more recently that was becoming much more of a job than it had been. And so uh, it seemed like a place where uh, we, the, the FreeBSD Foundation could come in and at least provide uh, the person who's going to do the sort of management piece of it at, so not necessarily to figure out the technical part, because we have a lot of members in our community that can help with the technical issues, but can at least be there and, and you know, deal with the immediate responses that need to go out and coordinate, find the correct people to deal with the problem and get them pulled in and working on it, et cetera. Uh, so in fact, as far back as 2002, we expanded it to a security team where we had the security officer who was doing the kind of management bit uh, and then the security officer, as I say, oversees the pool of people getting that done. Uh, and it's really, it used to be a part-time person, and now it's become almost a full-time job, at least in the last couple of years. And so that's where uh, the FreeBSD Foundation came in to, to help provide that person. It doesn't mean that everybody's off the hook, by no means. But uh, it does mean that there's going to be somebody that when the reporter calls up and says, what is FreeBSD doing? They at least get someone to answer the phone. All right. So 
the grand summary. The, the evolution of, of governance uh, model for leadership, uh, this has been something that you know, I, has been a particular interest to me because having been one of the benevolent dictators for life, uh, that was clearly not a model for something where you know, it was going to outlast me. And uh, so moving into having a core team for life was sort of the next logical step. Moving to an elected core team uh, seems to have worked well. And the project continues to move forward and, and grow, which is great. Uh, you know, if I get hit by a bus, the FreeBSD project isn't going to notice the difference. Um, four major changes in leadership. Each allowed the project to move forward and tackle new problems. Uh, you get people that come in and, and you know, the, the early, you know, getting BSD out uh, in the first place, getting, the, getting it open sourced was, uh, took a few years off of several of our lives. Um, it has certainly helped the project avoid the aging out. Uh, the median age has remained in the mid to high 30s, uh, at least over the last decade. Uh, and uh, the, the elected core, I mean, there's all kinds of things where that can go wrong. You can end up electing people that just aren't, you know. Core is much more of a management position than a technical position. I mean, they obviously have to have technical chops, but a lot of what they do, day-to-day -day management, is, is inter interacting with people. And uh, so the, the project as a whole seems to be pretty good at, at bringing up people that are, have those skill sets. Uh, and you, know, you want some turnover. You don't want it to just be the same group of people forever and ever. Uh, but you also don't want to turn everybody all at once, uh, unless they've gone really off the rails. Uh, and so you know, again, bad things could happen, but so far they haven't. And hopefully it will stay that way. Uh, the FreeBSD Foundation has provided needed resources and stability. Uh, they are somewhat the, the long-term uh, you know, memory of the organization. They deal with the long-term issues like making sure that the copyrights don't get abused and you know, all those kinds of things that you, know, just, you need somebody that's going to just do that more or less continuously. So they, they have the, the sort of longevity that's uh, needed for that. OK. so. What's my conclusion? My conclusion is the governance is mundane. And I'm amazed to have this many people sit and listen to me talk about it for an entire hour. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, too much of it is stifling. You can certainly overdo it. I have been in organizations that you know, all you want to do is run out the door to get a breath of air. Uh, but you can also go to the other extreme and say, oh, you know, it's all laissez-faire, blah, blah, blah. Too little in the project goes off the rails, collapses from lack of infrastructure. There's all kinds of bad things that can happen if you're not paying some attention to this stuff. So it, it's, a, it's a fine line. You, you know, it, people say, oh, you can't have enough. Oh, yes, you can. Uh, oh, you can't have too little. Oh, yes, you can. So uh, we seem to be doing pretty well here. And uh, hopefully, we will stay on that track. The thing to really note is that government requires constant tuning to keep that right balance. Uh, you know, it, it, you ebb and flow. You tend to bounce back and forth between too much and too little, uh, and you know you, you have to do do have to pay attention to it. But uh, when it's working, it should just you know be in the background, and you shouldn't really be all that aware of it. Okay, so with that, I will take any questions. Yes. What is CORE doing about it? <laughs> that's an excellent question. And that's why I'm not running for CORE. <laughs> you couldn't pay me. What was it? it? You know, if nominated, I will not run. And if elected, I will not serve. I, I did my 10 years. It's someone else's problem. <laughs> OK. Anything else? Yeah. In 2018, do you see CORE as more of a technical body or a board of directors? Do I see CORE more as a technical body or a board of directors? Yes is the answer to that. They are, in fact, doing both of those things. Uh, I mean, ultimately, there are some technical decisions that need to be made where there's disagreement. And hopefully, they can you know, help those people come to a resolution. Uh, but they have to be technical enough to be able to do that. They also 
are a board of directors. I mean, they, they are overseeing you know, all those different groups of people. They need to make sure that you know, those groups are working properly and if they're broken to figure out how to fix them. And you know, that's, that's management through and through. So you know, that's why I'm, I, it, I'm very pleased when I looked at the list of, of you know, people running for core that we have people that are across that entire spectrum. Um, you know. So I, I think I'm convinced that the, the core will have the various assets that they need. But you know, people, oh, I can't run for core. You know, I'm not a kernel hacker. Oh, that is malarkey. <laughs> yeah. How long have you been using video chat for monthly meetings and what tools? How long have I been using video chat for monthly meetings and what tools? Ah, I, you would have to ask the core people that. I haven't actually been paying attention to what they're using. It, it is, they use Google Hangouts. For about three years. Three. <laughs> what? <laughs> 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 been on the same Hangout for three years. Uh, okay, thank you, Benno. <laughs> See, you have to ask someone on core. They'll have the answer. <laughs> All right, anything, yeah. Uh, generally speaking, I mean, we were, we provide some things to core, you know, the pay for the when they were using you know uh, conference phoning, and uh, in the case of code of conduct, they came and said they you know wanted some money to get p people to help them with it when they did Rev two. Um, generally speaking, the, the, the you know now with my foundation hat on, um, we're. We're very sensitive to not somehow being viewed as taking over the project. Um, now, it, I will point out that some of CORE is actually also foundation board member, so you know that it, it's a fine line that we're walking there. But um, our goal is that the project runs and we are there as a support service, and when they want some help, they'll come and ask, and we will try and provide it. Um, but a lot of we're doing things that are sort of on the side, so trying to go out and raise awareness and provide travel grants. And a bunch of you here are being at least partially paid for your travel to come here, uh, and Google Summer of Code related things and so on. Uh, but the the goal of the foundation is to just be sort of quietly on the side, and that the project and core should be driving what's going on in the project itself. Okay. All right. <laughs>